Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, our maker, our sustainer, our father, our redeemer, we give you praise. We give you praise because you are worthy of it. And we give you praise because we are beneficiaries of your kindnesses multiplied to us. We pray this morning as we open your word together, as we remember the death of your son at the cross, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, cause us to hear your word, to understand your word. God, would we be pleasing to you and be conformed in greater measure to your son. And we ask for your help in these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For a few brief moments, coronavirus brought the world together. And as those brief moments fled away, coronavirus tore the world apart. Our world is divided on about every issue that can be conceived related to coronavirus. It's potential for divisions to make their way into the church as well. For divisions that are experienced in the world, differences in opinions, differences in preferences, differences in background, to make their way into the body of believers. What I hope to do this morning is to put our hearts in 1 Corinthians 11, this great passage where Paul instructs the Corinthian believers about the Lord's table. Uh, this morning will be a mini message leading into our celebrating the Lord's table together. And my hope is that the words here in 1 Corinthians 11 will help us to value a unity that transcends circumstance. It is a unity that is purchased by the infinite cost of the blood of Christ himself. And it is a unity that produces a oneness, a togetherness that has infinite proportions because it goes way beyond this life. It brings us together as a family through life-altering realities that endure forever. I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we begin just by looking at a simple phrase in verse 18. When you come together as a church, Paul writes, I think this phrase has newfound significance for us. When you come together as a church, and we come together around a table, some bread and some juice. These are symbols, signs, pointers to life-altering realities. And we prepare our hearts this morning for the Lord's table or communion. And four times in this chapter, the phrase is used, when you come together, when you come together, when you come together. This togetherness is significant, especially for the church at Corinth. The, the believers at Corinth had allowed worldly and fleshly divisions to infiltrate the church and to affect the blood-bought unity that God had for his people. The Corinthian believers had quarrels over favorite teachers. They expressed selfishness over spiritual gifts. They engaged in lawsuits over temporal matters and they promoted scandals over flaunted freedoms. And so when we come to 1 Corinthians 11, look at verse 17. Paul says, In giving you this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. The coming together for the Corinthian believers was marked not by the unity that God intended, but by a commitment to selfishness that promoted division. You know, look down at verse 20. Paul says, Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first. One is hungry and another is drunk. And Paul is indicting the Corinthian church that while they were going through the motions of gathering together to proclaim the Lord's death around a table, they actually weren't doing the Lord's table. 
They weren't doing communion, even though they, they had the procedures for it. They were consumed with love of self rather than love for others. And it is very likely that the Corinthian believers were experiencing a selfishness around the Lord's table, treating it as a meal where some taking the wine would actually become intoxicated and others would fill their bellies with the food that, it was, that was provided, missing the point entirely that these were symbols of a proclamation of Jesus' death. And through gluttony and drunkenness, some Corinthian believers excluded others. It is very likely that the church at Corinth, preference was given to those who had prestige or power or sway. It may even be that some came first, came early to get a good spot, to get a head start against others. This is a, a remarkable set of fractures on display at the Lord's table. And we see the remedy that Paul gives all the way down in verses 33 and 34. He says, So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. See, the remedy was to put others in front of self, to give room and to give way to others' needs and others' preferences. Eat a meal at home. Let others go first. Put others before you. And what is this coming together supposed to be? Look at verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What this gathering together around a table with these symbols was intended by God to be were tangible signs of life-altering realities. A symbol, frankly, of sin, of, of the problem of mankind. That you and I are all creatures born in sin, who sin out of our very natures, and that our behaviors flowing out of our natures are actually offensive to God. And that no human could ever fix his own sin problem. You couldn't self-improve your way out of it. You could not good work your way away from it. You can't outdo your sin with some sort of man-made remedy. And the real problem with human sin is the problem of God. God's perfect holiness and justice demands perfect conformity to his likeness. And God cannot tolerate sin. He would cease to be good if he did so. And this creates an insurmountable problem for us creatures who sin by nature. If God can't tolerate sin and we can't help but sin, this is an impasse. And God himself in his kindness and love for sinners has made a way through the impasse. And he has done it through his own son, the son of his love, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Father sent to the earth to be a sin bearer. And Jesus went to a cross to hang there between God and man, to endure God's infinite wrath against sin in order to actually pay for sin. Our sin problem is a forensic problem. That is, it is a judicial problem. It is a problem before the law courts of heaven and justice must be done. And the only way that the just penalty for sin could ever be paid and sinners go free is that Jesus Christ serve as a substitute in the place of sinners. The problem of God, the problem of human sin, can only be solved by God's solution. The mere fact that God sent his son to die in the place of sinners is a demonstration that there is no other way for sinners to be saved. 
Look, if you could remedy your own situation, if you could pull yourself up by your own moral bootstraps, if you could get yourself out of your sin predicament, there is no way that God crushes the son of his love in your place. The perfect one, the innocent one, the holy one being treated as sin itself. If there was any other way for you to get out of your predicament, Jesus would not have gone to the cross. To demonstrate that our problem is as bad as God says it is and that the solution can only come from him, Jesus gladly came to earth and became the sin bearer for us. And to all those who turn in faith to Jesus Christ and completely cast themselves on his finished work at the cross to pay for sin, justice and mercy meet. And God in his kindness towards sinners is willing to treat the believing sinner as if he had never sinned at all and as if he had always done everything right. God has said to remove your sin as far from you as the east is from the west, to take that which is filthy and make it clean like white wool, to take that which is blood guilt red scarlet and make it white like snow. Those who believe in Jesus Christ are those who turn from sin and turn to him. They are those who cast their full confidence on him. They are those who surrender to him. You must know, friends, that if you do that very thing today, you can have eternal life. Reconciliation to God the problem of sin done away with judicially, forensically, forever. And a new life begins. The bread we are going to take is a symbol of the body of Christ. The juice that we will drink is a symbol of the blood of Christ. And I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to see what the body of Christ crucified in the place of sinners, the blood of Christ spilled in the place of sinners, accomplishes. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, that is, separated, have been sanctified once and for all, set apart unto Christ, never to be undone, saints by calling, that is, holy ones, declared holy ones, set apart by God's calling in repentance and faith. With all who in every place call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what comes to the sinner who believes grace from God and peace rather than wrath. Paul says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you in Christ Jesus that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the end of verse 8. God will confirm you to the end, blameless. Blameless. God in his grace willing to declare you to be other than what you were when you came to Christ. And this is how Paul addresses the Corinthian believers. Remember in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And the Corinthian believers, hearing that description, say, well, then who could? And you and I in this room reading this list must say, and who could? And Paul says, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Such remarkable things happen under the blood of Christ. Back to 1 Corinthians 11, 
Paul gives the warning, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And so a man must examine himself. What does it mean in this context to drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner? There is a, a general way to drink the cup in an unworthy manner, to not be in Christ. But Paul has something more specific in mind here, and it is misjudging the body. Look what he says in verse 29. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. And talking about the body of Christ and misjudging it here, he's not talking about the physical body of Jesus that died on the cross. He is talking about the body of Christ, which is the church, God's people gathered together, judged incorrectly. And we know this from verse 31. He says, in parallel, if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. In other words, we need to be looking at ourselves, the gathered body of believers together appropriately. And Paul, in giving the remedy to the Corinthian problem, <laughs> is to examine yourself, to wait for others, prefer others when you come together to celebrate the Lord's table. You see, division in the church undermines the proclamation of the Lord's death, which purchases a unity that transcends our circumstances. Believers, you and I have a remarkable opportunity in our coming together to proclaim what the world cannot touch, to experience a unity that the world could not understand. Many in our world today long for unity, but the force that brings Christians together from all cultures, all languages, all opinions, the whole political spectrum, every age, every kind of dress, every kind of food and language and culture is the blood of our crucified Savior. It brings us all together and it produces a unity that goes way past the time when our preferences and our politics and our practices will all go away. A unity that transcends this life. So that Christian, you have more in common with a third century North African believer whom you've never met than you do with people who look like you and talk like you and dress like you and listen to the same music you do and have the same sports teams you do today who don't know Christ. You have more in common with a believer in Papua New Guinea than in a neighbor who loves everything you love in this life but doesn't love Christ. You and I have a unity the world cannot touch. And that unity is to be felt and experienced and expressed when we come together to this table. The table of our crucified Savior. Where we take these tangible symbols, juice symbolizing his spilled blood, and a wafer as a symbol of his body. These are symbols of sins forgiven in a new family. At this time, the men are going to begin preparing the table for us. We've got a few different procedures that will uh, give us uh, just a little more time this morning. So we'll be a little bit slower. I want to talk through our new procedures. Uh, I don't know that these will be our procedures forever, but for the time being... Um, under the principles of just trying not to breathe each other's air and touch each other's things, um, we're going to be uh, taking a, a little bit different approach with the Lord's table. If it is appropriate for you to take the elements this morning, as the men come by, we'll not be passing anything down the aisles. Just hold your hands open, and the men will drop into your hands a single-serve communion packet. <laughs> it has juice and a wafer self-contained in it. Uh, just a reminder, these are not gluten-free, so if you need to be gluten-free, um, we, we haven't solved that one quite yet. Um, and again, we're just trying to walk through these things together. But if you intend to take the bread and the cup when the men come by, just put your hands out, and then um, we'll walk through taking these things together. I will just say these are um, a little bit different 
and uh, kind of feel like a flight attendant here. You know, the white lights lead to red lights indicating your emergency exits if we should lose pressurization to oxygen, all that stuff, right? I just want to tell you how to operate this. Um, there are two plastic flaps. There's a clear one on top that you just lift and pull off and the wafer is inside of there and then we'll take that together and then there's a second flap you pull and the juice is inside of there and we'll take that together. Um, if you happen to pull off both at the same time and make a mess, that's okay. We're just kind of learning how to do all this together. But I thought I would warn you so you know how that works. The Lord's table is not for everybody. You don't have to be a member at Grace Bible Church to partake, but you do have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You need to be one who has surrendered his or her life to the Lord, whose sins are forgiven, and we proclaim now his death because we rejoice in it, because we benefit from it. If you're not a believer, it would not be appropriate for you to take communion with us. We're so glad that you're here. And we would love to invite you into a conversation where we could talk to you about what it means to become a Christian. And so just um, don't take those. Also, uh, we're going to have a few moments of silence like we normally do when we take the Lord's table. That's an opportunity for you to examine your own heart, confess any known sins before the Lord, and rejoice in the forgiveness Jesus has produced. It's a great opportunity for us to be on short accounts with our Savior. And so the men are going to come forward at this time. Take a few moments to examine your heart, prepare your heart in prayer to remember the Lord's death, his resurrection, his ascension in glory, and his return, which we will proclaim together in a few moments. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you willingly, gladly came to earth to be our sin bearer. We thank you for the chance now in a few moments to celebrate that, to proclaim that with these symbols. Lord, we pray that we would judge your body, the church, rightly not rushing to be first in our preferences or our desires, but really rushing to see others' needs and desires and preferences met before our own, even as we live out what it looks like to be surrendered to you, the one who most modeled self-emptying love. We thank you for what the cross means, payment of sin, forgiveness, and for what the empty tomb means, that that payment was accepted by the Father and new life guaranteed. And we do eagerly await your return and proclaim these things until that day. And pray this all in Jesus' name. Now, if you'll take the wafer, and I'll read from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, verse 25, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together.
And then verse 26, Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. May it be so, not only in our gathering, but in our scattering, we proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus until he returns. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day, this opportunity to gather together. Thank you for the opportunity to sing together, to sit under your word together, and to tangibly remember the cross of our Savior once again. God, we ask that you would give us much help, much grace, as we walk through the ever-changing realities of our times. We know the things that do not change, your word, your faithfulness, your purpose, your plan, your character, your promises, and on these we ling, and of these we sing, in Jesus' name.